right. Thank you everybody for coming to our presentation today. I'm so glad that you could all make it. My name is Aaron McCune. I'm Brett Fiotti. And we are the project coordinators for this uh, project. So first up, I would like to just give an introduction to our project. Yeah, a little bit about the site itself. It's a 14 acre parcel located northeast of here, roughly 30 minutes. Um, it has recently been and generously donated by the Egan family to the University of Wisconsin Students Point Foundation, and that is currently doing the restoration and monitoring on the site. It has a lot of really cool upland and lowland aspects, such as the hemlock and old growth white pine, as well as Bloom Creek that runs along the north side. Um, which is a class one trout stream, as well as um, historical remnants such as the dam that's pictured here and the red pine plantation and right of way, as well as tag alder and wetland thickets. And this beautiful property was donated us by the family with who are you here today. So we just want to extend a special thank you to you. This is just a map showing the current cover takes on our property. Um, the, these cover types will be changing in the future for um, due to the management that we have done on the site already. Um, so this is just kind of a before picture. And we also like to highlight the trail that we have already put onto the site, which is highlighted there, as well as the campsite that we have cleared as well. And then we also like to highlight that there is a private property located in the center of the property. Our primary goals for this site is to pres preserve historical remnants such as the old mill, which is found on this site. Um, as Brett said, our trail will be highlighting these historical uh, remnants and we'll also have the primitive camp campsite on it. Our second goal is to control invasive and unwanted plant species such as buckthorn. We would like to positively alter the wildlife habitat for neotropical birds, woodcock, and amphibian species. Uh, we would like to develop a primitive campsite on the site and enhance plant species and structural diversity. We would really like to highlight all the project partners um, in this, as well as all the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point undergraduate students that are all here today, as well as the UWSP Foundation, Central Wisconsin Environmental Station, Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, Fisheries, Rough Grouse Society, and the professional organizations we have on campus here, such as Society of Ecological Restoration, the Wildlife Society, and Fire Crew. So I wanna start off our main presentation with the Natural Resource 459 class. Um, this project has two classes working on it. So first we're going to go into Natural Resource 459, which focuses on ecosystem management and restoration ecology. Um, our class has been meeting multiple times a week to develop different aspects of this plan. Students from each class were assigned into different groups and were responsible for different aspects of this project. Um, the different groups include upland, wetland, and historical, and we also have the 434 class liaison here who has helped do a lot of work on the site um, with different students. So with that, we are going to go to the geospatial team first. And hey everyone, my name is Otto De Castro. And I'm Ryan Cabell. And we are the GIS team. Um, we were responsible for collecting, analyzing, and displaying the geospatial data for this project with the intention of using it to manage fauna, flora, and for environmental education purposes. For this project, we chose to use Avanza apps for smartphones and to collect field data. And we use ArcGIS Pro software to analyze and create a map layouts for this project. Uh, for creating map layouts, we mainly started with Dr. Demchek's existing map package. This included things like the upland and lowland delineation, pre delineation of property boundaries. We also received an orthographic photo from the Wisconsin DNR GIS database and also soils data for our soils map from NRCS. We took all the data that the teams collected as well as the externally acquired data, and we made maps based on their protocols and objectives. You can also see the general layout of the map here. You can see Demchek's properties boundaries, our soils data, pre and all these maps we displayed in the final restoration monitor. 
In regards to the geodatabase storage, we created uh, different geodatabases for each activity that we were doing on, on the property. Uh, and we did that because we wanted to ensure that it would be an easy way to access this data for a specific activity that you're going out on the site. Like if you want to do the historic, something historic, you're going to use that specific database. We also created a database that's the Egon Base Map Geodatabase, which contains all the geospatial data for this project as just a, a backup. And for the final storage, we put all this data into the UWSP College of Natural Resources Projects Drive. And with that said, I'd like to invite the historical team to be continued for the presentation. Thank you. Hello, everyone. We are the historical team. I'm Alexander Kine. I'm Shannon Haley. I'm Kaylin Contreras. And I'm Jessica Vila. I'm Paul List. Uh, our team, uh, we had goals to find these historical sites, and then we needed to preserve them. And then with that, any material that we could find that it was of historical significance. And then we also wanted to create an educational program to keep that history alive. And so these are our three different sites. And from left to right, you can see we have the mill, and then we found the Rolstead home. Uh, it was the home and also the post office temporarily. And then at the end, we have the dam. The Egan property is located on what was known to early settlers as Township 25, which consisted of Rochelle, Albin, New Hope, and Polonia. You can see our parcel indicated here in the yellow box from an old surveying map of the time. Cutting through the site is what we know today as Spoon Creek, but was at the time called the South Branch of the South Branch of the Little Wolf River. This early name for the creek suggests its insignificance relative to nearby waterways. Alvin's distance from these larger waterways and from railroads um, made it uh, possible for the township to be covered in a heavy growth of timber. The site wasn't believed to be suitable for logging, however, because it was a rocky area with boulders distributed across the property from the late phase of glaciation in central Wisconsin. This made Alvin popular with logging companies later on as timber demand was on the rise and readily available lumber was increasingly difficult to come by. Between 1875 and 1900, Alvin had a large number of logging operations and with the help, help of Jack Harper, who was a top woodsman from Fond du Lac, he insisted the river was straight enough to float a log. So he brought in horse and ox teams to remove the large rocks from the river and they can still be seen throughout the property today as is visible in one of our pictures here. Big lumber companies used the area for timber and clear cut areas so that Alvin could continue to grow. In 1866, Ole Old Rolstead purchases 280 acres on the Sam Logan place of the Alvin Township and with his wife built a small home and sawmill. Ole Rolstead worked with Harper and successfully operated the sawmill for a number of years, keeping a logbook tracking his business transactions. He manufactured lumber, planking, shingles, lath, and fence board, as can be seen here in the top. Um, he sold the, this lumber to local towns members and the town of Alvin itself. Around the same time, the dam was constructed with a sluiceway, which is a sliding gate within the structure that served to control the flow of water and greatly improve logging. This second picture depicts a similarly constructed dam built by Oli's son several miles upstream, which operated a similar establishment in Northland. In 1873, Oli Rolstead established a post office from his home on our site. People had to come from the farms nearby if they wanted their mail. And this location was somewhat inconvenient, so the post office was discontinued on October 8, 1880, and here we can see an old newspaper article telling us this. So in October of 1881, Ole Olson Rolstad passes his sawmill on to his son George, also known as Jorgen. Um, in 1895, uh, survey maps and tax roll records indicated that Carl O. Rolstad owned the property um, and the sawmill. Um, this picture on the right is a picture of one of the Rolstead mills. This one, unfortunately, was in Northland, but we can assume that they were very similar. 
Um, in 19, sorry, 1899, um, Hans Johnson ended up owning the property. Um, he was very interested in logging and mills, um, so he ended up logging extensively on the Little Wolf River. And this is it. Um, here is a taxable record from the UWSB archives. Um, it's showing Hans Johnson owning the property, and he ended up paying $122.06 um, in the year 1899. Um, on October 22nd, 1903, his mill, along with 400,000 uh, feet of lumber, did go up in flames, um, along with a house, a planing mill, um, and one dwelling house or a store building. Um, these two are just uh, newspaper articles dating that fire that occurred. Um, and we, Ike Anderson um, ended up owning the property in 1915. Um, he did actually, he was a mail carrier for the Rolsteads um, back when the post office was in the Rolstead house. Um, and he ended up making a grist mill, um, which you can see his little name right there under in the section 34. And then this is just um, from a book stating that he was the mail carrier. Um, unfortunately, we are missing a lot of historical data. Um, there were a few fires that went through Alban um, throughout the 1900s. So we are missing information. Um, we know that before the Egan's owned the property, um, Eric A. Fisher and Genevieve R. Fisher did own the property. Um, and on May 19th, 1971, they sold the property to Burdett and Sarah Egan. Um, on the right here is the deed from that day that they wrote out right before they bought the property. And then comes the history that the university is a little bit more familiar with, which is the Egan property donation to the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. After purchasing this 14 acre property along Flynn Creek, the Egan's planted many red pines, specifically 3,000 to 4,000 of them. The Egan's owned their plot of land for about 50 years. And in 1984, Bud Egan retired after serving UWSP for 33 years. And in his time at UWSP, he served as the vice chancellor of academic affairs. Bud donated the property in his late wife's name who valued educating children about nature and the environment. With the donation to UWSP, Bud had hopes of supporting the Central Wisconsin Environmental Station to continue on his wife's values. The Burdett and Sarah Egan Nature Education Preserve was donated to UWSP with the intent of being an environmental field site and to be managed by the College of Natural Resources. As an environmental field site, some educational opportunities would be for students within SWES as well as UWSP students. Some of these educational opportunities would include field trips with various learning objectives as Paul is going to cover next, undergraduate stream studies, wildlife observation, and many other potential learning and educational opportunities. As Jesse said, this site will be used by a variety of different groups from the university and other public groups facilitated by SWES programming. So we want to make sure that this site is accessible to all those visitors, and that they will be able to connect with sites from history from the Rolsteads through the more recent history with restoration, as well as its directions for future growth. So to help accomplish this, we have been creating a trail that would go through the site. This trail begins at the parking lot, connects to the various historical structures we found on site, and then connects as well to the sites of ongoing restoration and monitoring work. And to help allow visitors to uh, follow the trail and understand its significance, we're in the process of creating a trail guide. Trail guide is still someone in development, but this is where currently stands as a draft. Trail guide will be available as a paper copy at the start of the trailhead in just a standard trifold brochure form. And it'll also be available electronically as a QR code to be posted on the entrance site. Trail guide will have an image of the map with various points labeled along the trail and corresponding information about those different points to allow visitors to understand the significance of the various sites they're seeing. In addition to just some standard overarching information about the overall site history and purpose. In addition to the self guided interpretation, we'll be facilitating a variety of educational programs at the site through the Central Wisconsin Environmental Station. These programs could have various audiences, ranging from K 12 groups that come to the SWES for field trips, uh, students who come up for summer camp programming, as well as students with the Tomorrow River Community Charter School, which is located, located on site at SWES. It offers a unique opportunity for some more extended duration programming over the course of months, three to years. These programs will be primarily based on either the historic or the ecological aspect, but programs detailing some of the site's history, allowing students to explore the various structures that are found on site, 
We also have programs that involve students in the ongoing stewardship of the site, own them in aspects such as invasive species removal, some of the monitoring protocols, maybe tree planting, and other forms of engagement to help them connect with the site's ecology and help them to develop a greater sense of ownership for the site's ongoing restoration needs. In addition, we'll be developing a primitive campsite, and that site will be used primarily by summer camp programming. And I'll offer you an opportunity for some various other forms of activities and lessons that we might not be able to do quite so much normally. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to the Upland team. They'll begin discussing some of the ongoing restoration work. Thanks for coming today. We're the Upland team. My name is Allie Blake. I'm Jacob Kriegel. I'm Kelly Adam. I'm Tushar Moon. Bill with Corset. I'm Casey Robinettes. So starting off with our current state of conditions, there's variable vertical structure, an uneven distribution of coarse woody debris, two distinct age classes, and an inconsistent matrix mixed with native and not native species. So as you can see in the photo on the far left, there's two distinct age classes, and the one on the right really highlights the course woody debris and multiple decomposition classes. So continuing with our current staying conditions, there's a small field in the southeast that currently functions as a parking lot, but it's also a prime seeking ground for woodcock, which is one of our target species. Moving on, there's an open ground area following the power lines. And as mentioned earlier, a private residence in the center of the property. So, just to give you the scale, this is what the private residence sort of looks like. And that's the open area ground under the power lines with the red lines. So I'm going to be discussing the grassy opening. So here's a zoomed in map of what I will be talking about. And we wanted to show you the current thing conditions just to really understand where it is now and where we want to go with it. So for our targets, we would like to reach 30% 30 30 grassland cover type, 25% brushy cover type, and then adding some increased soft mass production. So how we're gonna get there is our actions UASP students have currently, and we'll continue to be managing the Eden property. We have done planting, such as adding Indian grass. Whenever the timing is right, we would like to do some prescribed burning. Some actions that have already been done is cutting and piling staghorn sumac. Coppicing the species allows it to vigorously re sprout, adding an increased soft mass production in the next years. Um, I will be talking about the red pine area and the right of way, um, which was seen earlier for that strip up the center of it, um, which you can see here. Um, our future trail will also run through this area, as you can see with the tiger tracks in the bottom. Um, our targets for this area are to increase soft and hard mass species. Um, we'll be doing this by coppicing, and we have already coppiced the American hazelnut, which, like the sumac, will allow it to sprout. Um, we will also be planting soft mass species um, such as cherry, uh, red or dogwood, and hawthorn. So I will talk, be talking about the conifers and hardwoods, which is distributed throughout the property. These are just some images of the conifers and hardwoods on site. So for targets, we want to promote white spruce and increase the current cover type from 19% to about 29%. Our actions are, we have actually already planted 100 white spruce, which was divided between upland and riparian area. The reason why white spruce was chosen is because it's deer resistant and deer will not browse on it. And it will also improve conifer thermal cover for species that rely on it for habitat. And also it will increase the diversity among the balsam firs. So I had the brush prairie uh, type and it kind of shows you an aerial photo of where we're managing. And this is a picture of part of the site, kind of shows the current stand conditions and what we've done so far. So um, some of these targets were already met within the first year of management. So um, the first target that we had was to decrease the density of undesirable species. And with our undesirable species, we wanted to create habitat brush piles. And the main reason why we want to create uh, habitat brush piles is to provide 
animal shelter and nesting sites for bird species. And we also want to promote soft mass and hard mass species for targeted uh, birds as well. So what we've done so far is we've already decreased some of the undesirable species on site with the UWSB students and volunteers. And then some of the undesirable species that we already removed was box elder, European buckthorn, prickly ash, and honeysuckle. So like I said before, we used those undesirable species that we removed to make those habitat brush piles. And then we've already planted and promoted some of the soft and hard mass species on site. Some of the soft mass species include plums, cherry, hawthorn, grapes, red osier dogwood, and then for the hard mass, it includes uh, the American hyssops. All right, next is the mixed hardwoods area. And here's a map uh, showing where it is, which is on the south portion of the property. And then here's a picture from the site. <clears throat> Some targets for the area are increased uh, species diversity, um, overstory removal, and promote the soft and hard mass species. Um, some actions that we're going to take to reach those targets are planting multiple species that are not currently there, um, use expanding gap method, and maintain the hard and soft mass species that are currently there. And lastly, we've got a couple goals that we've been working on uh, that apply throughout the site. Our uh, first of which is to reduce control of invasive and undesirable species. That includes um, the box elder that was on site. That includes a uh, top right picture of the, some wind thrown trees that if you know, hazardous. Uh, we'll remove those. Our priority for this goal is uh, to center our efforts around the campground and the trails, because we don't want, you know, little children running around and playing ivy at the campsite. We don't want pets um, getting crushed by trees, things like that. Um, in order to achieve these goals, we'll be cutting stems again, like the box elder, the prickly ash, everything that's mentioned, and we'll be applying herbicide, uh, mixture of glyphosate, garlon, uh, milestone, things like that, uh, depending on where we apply them. And we will also be removing any hazard trees, like I said. Our second goal is to reduce uh, disease susceptible species on site. Um, this includes some of the oaks and uh, some of the cherries. And our priority is visitor safety and stand durability. Again, we don't want any of these uh, dead hangs landing on visitors who are there for educational or recreational purposes. And we would like to favor disease resistant species in the future. Um, luckily, we don't have any large pockets of disease susceptible trees. You know, you've got a whole forest full of ashes that when the ash borer comes through, you lose the forest. Uh, but luckily we only have a few and those are easy to manage for and they will mostly be left as snags for wildlife. And uh, as we move forward, I will be replacing them with a uh, hardier, more diverse species, which will increase the overall diversity and hardiness on site. And then lastly, um, our final goal for the whole site is to increase snag density and of course we need debris. Um, as it stands, we don't have a lot of diversity within the decomposition classes. And our priority is to improve habitat suitability uh, for all the wildlife on site and increase structural, structural diversity. Uh, we will be favoring the amphibians, pollinators, birds, and mammals on site that we are monitoring and managing for. Um, namely, our probably our largest effort on site is to increase brush piles, uh, habitat piles. Those are suit, they are suitable for shelter and uh, they provide escapism for mammals. Um, habitat for amphibians and food for uh, soft mass in the future because we will be planting and we have planted uh, grape around the uh, brush pile that will grow up into them as they as time goes on. And we will also be creating drumming locks throughout the site, probably about one per acre. Uh, this will be good for the grass. Uh, like I said, brush piles and snags all around the site. And we would like to eventually reach 800 cubic feet uh, per acre of down wood on the site. Um, and we'll be achieving this by choosing and felling about a tree per acre every three years to uh, get the decomposition class more diversified. And with that, we'll hand it off to our area team. All right, hello everyone. We are the riparian team. We were uh, charged with managing the section of the property that most closely borders Flume Creek. My name is Ben Noble. I'm Willow Tingle. I'm John Bruner. I'm Ian Walton. I'm Forrest Winifred. So our objectives for the riparian part of the site in terms of wildlife were to favor neotropical migratory birds, 
specifically American red start, veery, and yellow warbler that we know heavily utilize wetland habitats. We also wanted to favor woodcock, of course, favor or at the very least remain neutral to amphibians and other herps and remain neutral to the trout and the trout stream. However, the DNR is working on a habitat restoration project on that stream there. In terms of plants, we wanted to make sure that we cut back the dominating tag alder, which was pretty much all one size and age group. We're expecting some re-sprout to create a more uh, favorable habitat there. Um, to further help increase the structural diversity, we wanted to plant long-lived overstory trees like swamp white oak and a mix of understory shrubs like red odor dogwood and high bush cranberry. We also wanted to add that thermal cover that the Upland team had mentioned in the form of white spruce. And finally, while invasives were not dominating the property, we also wanted to focus on removing any undesirable species that we found there like buckthorn. So most of the riparian area consists of a dense tag alder thicket with some uh, sparse overstory trees. Um, there's also a smaller forest wetland with more overstory cover in the northeastern corner of the stand. Um, there are some patches of red osier dogwood along the creek, which will play an important part for the restoration work that we are doing. Um, there are some small pockets of invasives, but they aren't too widespread. And we have also found numerous groundwater seeps on the site that are important for some of the amphibians. So here along from Creek on the north side, you can see the tag alder, and then up in the far northeast corner, there's the forest of wetland. And then here, the yellow marks here are representing the uh, groundwater seeps that we have found on the site. Yeah, so for the overall vision of the site, we have a few main goals. One is to improve the habitat and structural diversity for birds on the site, particularly near tropical migrant birds and woodcock, and these birds will use this site as breeding, nesting, and feeding grounds. Another main vision of the site is to improve or continue future management and potentially provide, well, we will provide education opportunities out there for particularly uh, SWES students, and maybe OESP students. And we want to continue just creating valuable habitat for birds and to use the trout. And then just for student education, we could make uh, less control habitat management this year's site and find more invasive and stuff, et cetera. And for the desired future conditions, we want to have an early successional habitat, which has lots of structural diversity. Uh, we want to reduce invasives, and this will also help improve the regeneration of native species, which will also improve the understory and overstory. And we also want to maintain uh, buffers around the seeds of food tree. All right, so talking about the targets specific to this area, uh, target number one was to reduce the invasives that are present to under 5% of the total cover. Uh, as Willow mentioned just now, uh, invasives are not dominating the site by any means, so we find this 5% number to be definitely feasible for our group. Uh, a coppice, a 20% coppice of that tag alder thicket every six years, uh, this is going to create valuable early successional habitat for the previously mentioned birds, that's the American Red Star, the Veery, and the Yellow Warbler. Um, so every, you work out the math on that, every 30 years we want to rotate this tag alder completely, so we're always uh, providing that early successional habitat for these birds. And uh, lastly, we want the mature overstory trees left on the site, uh, but they shouldn't dominate. Uh, this is a wetland area, um, the forested wetland up in the corner, uh, currently has the most overstory trees present on the site. And so what we're hoping for is that when these trees, uh, you know, inevitably die, they will fall and leave coarse woody debris or provide valuable snags for these bird species. Talking about actions to get there, uh, cutting holes into that tag alder thicket, as I mentioned, uh, that's going to create that early successional habitat. Uh, 20, roughly 20% 20 of that tag alder, again, we want to kind of blow a hole in uh, every six years, and that's, uh, that's going to keep it from being so, like, we didn't really want to dry, draw straight lines around it. We want it to more closely mimic uh, successional habitat that you would find naturally. Uh, we're going to use that tag alder that we cut to create habitat piles. Uh, these habitat piles are going to function the same purpose that the upland crew talked about. Uh, we're just going to be using tag alder. Uh, treating any of the invasives, the buckthorn specifically, with herbicide uh, to help get to that below 5% number. And uh, the planting of hard and soft mat species 
it, specifically in the uh, tag alder coppices where we'll have light reaching the ground, it will have a little more room to grow. And for uh, plants specifically, we planted red osier dogwood, high bush cranberry, and then that swamp white oak is, is there to provide that hard mass and a little bit of cover as well. So these actions have already, most of our uh, initial entry activities have already taken place by our two classes and then our uh, implementation class, uh, 43, 432, or 434. And uh, the initial coppice of Tag Alder has taken place. Uh, we had to go out with the GIS team and map out and drop points and, and get a really good understanding of what's on the site before we conducted any of this. And, uh, and from there, we went mapped the invasives and uh, to this day, you want to click ahead. We've uh, we've already planted our red osier dogwood, swamp white oak in those openings that we cut of some of the coppice tag alder, and uh, in as well as planting our uh, great swamp white oak in a uh, high bush uh, cranberry. And as far as future entries are concerned, uh, continuing the coppice of the tag alder, like Ben was saying, for years to come, to keep the varying levels of successional habitat in that tag alder. And uh, planting understory shrubs will continue and the removal of invasive species will just have to continue for, for years to come. All right, with that, we have the implementation liaison. Hello, I'm Sean Buehler. I was the Forestry 434 implementation liaison. And the overall objective is to make sure all the activities done by Forestry 434 aligned with the goals of natural resources 459 and 457. And what Forestry 434 is, it's a restoration field techniques course taught, taught by Dr. Demchek, which emphasizes various skills that students may use in the restoration field, anywhere from brush saws, chain saws, tractor training, and wildlife inventory skills. And the ones that were specific to even property were the S212 wild and chainsaw training. And during that, they felled trees, which was beneficial to us because they cleared a lot of that upland area of the box elder. And then we had brush saw and uh, habitat power construction, which aided in removing a lot of invasives and coppice the first set of alder thickets. And then the Society of Ecological Restoration also coppice an area in the northeastern area of the property. And then just last week, we had a tree planting activity. Um, we planted a lot of dogwood, spruce, and oak. And then next Monday, we will be doing our first wildlife inventory. And that's been the most weather dependent one because it's been kind of cold. Um, so that's been difficult. And then here, we just have some images of that coppice alder area. One was in the winter time, and that is pretty recent, but generally the same area. And then this image in the, the outline in the lower left here is um, adjacent to Flume Creek. That was the first cut we did of the tag alder. And then in the northeastern section is where we had SER, the Society of Ecological Restoration, um, come in and clear that. So now we're going to be transitioning to the monitoring plan, which is created by our Natural Resource 457 class. Another title for that would be the Ecological Monitoring Class. Uh, for this section, we have the Wildlife and Plant Team, and with that, I'm going to hand it off to them. Hello, Wildlife Team. My name is Erin Richards. My name is Kelly Amber. Two years ago, John Brunner, Forest Lambert. And the, our objective, our main goal for uh, the wildlife team was to develop some protocols that we could use to monitor um, our species here, the American woodcock, uh, neotropical migrant birds, which are, will be mentioned later, and uh, our various frogs, just so that way in years to come, we can see what kind of impact we are having on these species. And uh, the protocol is really there for other future volunteers and students to, to really understand what we were doing and, uh, and get a better data set to compare. So the reason why we, monitor, we are monitoring for these neotropical migratory birds is because they're indicators to the health and productivity of our site. We've also seen a population decrease of anywhere from 40 to 50 percent because there's not a suitable habitat for them. And management to one normally leads to benefiting another. 
So the upland species include the Toby, Eastern Wood Peely, Caminoco, and Rose Rusty Toasty. The lowland and riparian species include the berry, yellow warbler, and American red shirt. And then the five main vegetative cover types across upland and lowland that these species and prefer include the deciduous and coniferous species matrix, a dense understory and shrub layer, forest edges, clearings, and prairies, wet riparian areas, and secondary successes. So we took the map of the GIS teammate that you've seen plenty of times already of the existing cover types and found that it pretty perfectly matched the main cover types preferred by our birds. So just as a visual representation of our thought process here, we started with over 20 points and cut it back to 10 with, with the intent of accurately representing or fully representing each cover type. And you can see we also included just visually where you would find each bird. The monitoring protocol was a point question method. It will be only present absence and the points were chosen based, like I said, on the habitat, habitat type of each bird that is preferred. And there is a 50 meter buffer of uh, assumed observable distance. The present absence observation will only be by sight or sound, but probably by sound, you're more likely to hear it. You know, they're pretty small. And surveyors will remain at each point for 15 minutes and tally on the observation sheet that was created loosely based on what TWS uses for their solid owl project. We modified it to fit our needs. And observations will be conducted on days when it's clear and sunny, with low winds, easy to hear, easy to see at dawn and dusk because that's when you're likely to see songbirds. And we took the migratory patterns of all the birds and found that the best overlap of all of them would be between April and July. So that's hopefully when we'll be doing it. And this is just a map without the birds of where all of our 10 monitoring points will be. So here's our frogs. We've got the boreal chorus frog, the spring peeper, and then the wood frog. And uh, we chose to monitor for these frogs because they emerge early in the spring, which works out well for our timeline. And uh, they're also very easy to, to hear. Uh, if you've ever heard spring peepers, you know, they're like, beep, 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 in spring, they're just crazy. So uh, that's why we chose these. And uh, the reason we wanted to monitor for frogs was that frogs are very sensitive to environmental contamination and pollution. And uh, these frogs in particular are a great indicator for us to make sure that we're not damaging the great habitat that's already present on the site with our future and uh, current activities. So we decided on a presence absence style survey where we'll just be listening for the calls of each of these species. We chose predetermined points based on the locations of those groundwater seats that we identified that we believe frogs are very likely to use. The points span a significant portion of the lowland area with the idea being that a variety of habitat elements can be represented on the survey. Our monitoring protocol was borrowed from the Wisconsin Frog and Toad Survey, which outlines ideal conditions for monitoring. Unfortunately, weather has not allowed us to get out and survey during the suggested peak dates for these species, which are April 8th through April 30th, when the water has warmed to at least 50 degrees Fahrenheit. It's also suggested that wind would be less than seven miles per hour. There could be some humidity or drizzle, but no steady rain, no significant changes in air temperature, and preferably it would also be done near or after dark. So like I said, weather has not allowed us to get out and perform the surveys, but as our implementation liaison mentioned, we do have an upcoming date scheduled. And this is the map of where that's going to happen. The yellow teardrops are the groundwater seeps that we identified and the red triangles are our survey points. We put our survey points 75 feet into the upland area so that they could be easily and safely accessed by surveyors. And that's also why we have one up on the road. So we also focused on the American woodcock as a species. And in order to monitor for the species, we first need to understand the habitats that they normally inhabit. So some of their habitats that they're uh, commonly found is in young forests, shrublands, and open grasslands, where they usually use the, the grasslands for the breeding sites. And that's most important for us because that's where we're going to monitor. And they also really like tag alder pockets, mainly because it provides really nice nesting sites for them. And they usually like pockets with different ages of tag alders. 
So before starting the Woodcock Monitor Protocol, we first had to map out some of the areas for the singing grounds. Like I showed you before, um, there was a picture on, for the Eakin site, and that was a perfect area for us to do the singing ground survey. And we would survey by observation, which is using sight or sound. And the main reason why we choose this uh, method is because it doesn't require strict permits and it doesn't have liability issues with the university. Um, this is also the Woodcock breeding periods map. Because we're in central Wisconsin, the dates that they're going to mainly be breeding is April 25th and up to May 20th. And this can be subject to change because of temperatures and conditions. Similar to what we've had in the last week or two, we weren't able to really survey them. And then uh, this is subject to change and possibly be outdated because of uh, climate change. Yeah, to ex expand on the Woodcock Monitoring Protocol a little bit more, all these surveys will be done in the evenings, ideally uh, 22 to 58 minutes after sunset. Once we get there, we'll have to record the weather conditions, if it's overcast, et cetera. Um, and at each site, we're going to be there for five minutes, and then we're going to tally just what we see over there. Uh, and these are the two sites that we're going to be serving the Woodcocks in. The one in the bottom corner is the parking lot, and the one at the top is where the proposed future campsite is going to be. And so the main reason why we're interested in monitoring woodcocks is there's been a very significant decline in their habitat population since the 1970s. Um, as you can see on the map, where it's red is where they live, and you can see it's decreased significantly from then to there. And where the darker red is is where they used to be more densely, and now you can see that's pretty much not a percent. Hello, everybody, with the plant monitoring team for the site. Um, my name is Casey Walker Daniels. I'm Jacob Freeman. Ian Walton. Sam Sanders. I'm Ross Stewart. I'm an OM. Uh, I'm the person. So, as a basic overview, our team was supposed to collect baseline data to determine whether or not the restoration techniques implemented were successful. We collected data from the forest overstory and understory, and then we are going to collect in, uh, data on the spring ephemerals and graminoids when the weather's permitting. And then along with that, we also monitored the basic species and then also made a plant identification booklet containing descriptions and pictures of all the common species on the site. So we're lucky on this site to have a diverse range of different cover types that we've already kind of discussed, um, some of those being the box elder opening, the tag alder, the hardwoods and the conifers. Uh, this is just a reminder of the uh, distribution of those across the site. So for common overstory species, you can divide it into hardwoods and conifers. For our hardwoods, we have white oak, red oak, black cherry, red maple, black ash, aspen species, and then some paper birch. For our conifers, red and white pine dominated, but there were a few sizable white spruce that are worth mentioning. So for our grassland associated species, species such as little blue stem, Indian grass, black eyed Susan, prairie drop seed, tough hair grass, and Virginia wild rye in the riparian areas are common. With our recent planting, we're hoping species such as little blue stem and Indian grass can take root. Well, we have many desirable species that are across the site on both the upland and lowlands. Um, in the upland, we have uh, hazelnut, wild plum, and uh, just to name a few. And then uh, in the lowlands, we have uh, red ocean dogwood, white spruce, balsam fir, and uh, tack And in the grasslands, we've got a good mix of warm and cool season grasses that we hope to improve over time. Um, we've got plenty of rubus on site, uh, which is great for cover and soft mass. And then we've got staghorn sumac, which we have already discussed coppicing and planting for. For undesirable species on site, uh, you've already heard a bunch of them. For woody vegetation, we wanted to focus mainly on the buckthorn, the prickly ash, and the barberry that are on site. And then for non-woody vegetation, uh, we've got the spotted napweed and honeysuckle and poison ivy in a couple of places that we need to manage more. And then some factors that could impact our species composition on site could be things such as deer browse, um, encroachment of non-native and undesirable species, and then wind, wind damage, which can sometimes be beneficial. This can help with creating more snags, regeneration of new species and in turn opening up uh, sections for, for wildlife. And then 
then these are just the vegetation survey points that we use to collect our data on. Um, there's 20 sampling points on this on this map. So the data we collected from our survey points include our overstory data and understory data. And because of the cold spring, we've yet to get to spring ephemerals, grasses, invasives, and then we'll be listing any of our other newly planted species. So for the overstory data, we collected an average of diameter of breast height of 11.2 inches throughout the stand with a range from two inches to 37 and a half inches and a pretty consistent species composition. So our red pine, oaks, aspens, cherries. Uh, for our understory data, we found no species cover over 20%. So that also included a pretty sizable amount of balsam fir, sumac and alder. And as you can see here, uh, our alder was at 12%, balsam fir 20%, current sumac was at 17%. And then how we collected that data was through randomized point sampling using 20 plot points. Um, and then the data that we collected was measured into Excel, analyzed to determine if the wildlife uh, there had preferred species. And then we repeated those steps if vegetation classes were not present due to the seasonal constraints. And then for the spring ephemerals, we're going to use a meter squared quadrant. We're going to use one that's made of PVC pipe, but it can be made out of anything. It just matters that it's a one meter square. And then in that one meter square, we're going to count the species present, and that should give us a representative sample of the cover type on the uh, spring ephemerals and remnants. And then for understory, we're going to do a one 500 acre plot, and then again, count the species present. To get the overstory data, we used a 10 factor prism and we listed the species that were present there. And then we also using the prism got the basal area and the trees per acre for the density in the areas that we had. And then going forward, we're gonna be using our monitoring to determine the health and success of our restoration efforts. Um, so we'll be using that to look at the stuff that we are leaving as it is. But we also use that to check the development of our intended cover types of the grassy opening and the brush prairie going forward. And here's just a map of the cover types that we look to monitor going forward in the future. That will close up, Aaron. All right, on this last slide, we have our site mascot. The photo credit goes to Shannon Haley, along with many other photos that she's provided us. The yellow room warbler. And at this time, I believe we have a few minutes left. If you have any questions or comments for us at this time, feel free to ask. And thank you all for coming.